welcome everybody here this evening. Tonight, the Kansas Attorney General's Office pre Office presentation over human trafficking is part of the Created Equal program series. Created Equal America's Civil Rights Struggle is made possible through a major grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities as part of the Bridging Cultures Initiative in partnership with the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. This evening's presenter is Jennifer Rapp. Jennifer began working as the Deputy Director of the Anti-Human Trafficking Unit in the Victim Services Division of the Office of the Attorney General Derek Schmidt in 2013. She is Chair of both the Public Awareness and Prevention and Data Collection and Collaboration Committees of the Kansas Human Trafficking Advisory Board. Additionally, she serves as the Public Information Officer and Chief Spokesperson for the Attorney General's Office. A fourth generation Kansan and KU graduate, she recently returned to Kansas after working in Washington, D.C. as a congressional staffer for the Kansas de delegation and holding various positions in government affairs and public relations in the state of Florida. Jennifer has three children and lives in Lawrence. Welcome, Jennifer. Brandon and um, congratulations on getting the grant. I think that's fabulous for your community that you all apply for such a prestigious grant and were awarded the grant and are able to bring in programming. We were talking a little bit about some of the other speakers and activities, movies and things like that. Really it sounds like you know the purpose is to start public discussion on some of these important issues surrounding civil rights and human rights. And so I'm delighted, I was uh, excited to be invited to come and be a part of this series. Um, human trafficking is certainly a human rights issue. Um, I'm not sure how much you all know about human trafficking. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it is and what it isn't. Um, tell you a little bit about uh, victims of human trafficking. Give you information about traffickers. Um, and um, the demand side, which is also an important part um, of the human trafficking issue to discuss. Um, so I thought I would start, and then at the end um, we'll have time for questions, and I was telling a couple of the people who arrived early, I really hope you all, we have a small group, and it would be a great opportunity if you do have questions about anything that I said or about anything that I didn't say that you're interested in or you wondered maybe why I didn't mention, um, I hope you'll ask me and we can have kind of a discussion and a dialogue. I think that's the advantage of having a small group. So with that, I will start. Um, we will start with some, somebody to open this discussion that you all are very familiar with here in Independence. That would be the Attorney General. I'm Derek Schmidt, your Kansas Attorney General. Human trafficking is the second largest and fastest growing criminal industry in the world. More than 83% of human trafficking involves domestic victims, and the majority of these are children. The U.S. Justice Department has identified Kansas as an originating state for human trafficking, which means it's our own kids who are at risk. All exploited children are victims, even if no force or coercion is present. Kansas has adopted new laws to protect and rescue human trafficking victims, especially children. If you or someone you know is being trafficked, report it. <clears throat> January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. It's time to take a stand and make a difference. Together, we can stand up for human dignity in Kansas. Call the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline, 888-373-7888. So, um, as the Attorney General says, there are also some new laws that have been passed in the last year that I'm going to go into just briefly a little bit about what some of those are and why, why we passed the new laws. To begin, um, obviously the state of Kansas has a long history in the issue of slavery, for sure, and just being at the library, and if you all have been part of other discussions, I'm sure you're well aware uh, of the history and the role the state of Kansas had. It was a very important role. Human trafficking is also known as um, modern, it's a modern form of slavery. And although slavery was, you know, technically abolished 150 years ago, um, the statistics tell us that there are more people enslaved today than at any other time in our history as a country, which is just, you know, shocking to a lot of people to hear. <clears throat> what is human trafficking? Human trafficking is based on recruiting, harboring, and or transporting people solely for the purpose of exploitation. 
Um, the and or is something that people ask about a lot, and the next slide will differentiate between human trafficking and human smuggling because they, they often overlap, but they're two different things. The common factor in all human trafficking is that the victim has no freedom to leave a situation. Um, there are two different forms of human trafficking. There's labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Um, generally, what goes on in a human trafficking situation is, is exploitation of a person's vulnerabilities. Um, and the trafficking industry thrives on ignorance, on people, the general public, not knowing what's going on in their own community. Um, and folks who are uneducated, victims, or just the general public about it. As I mentioned, trafficking and smuggling often overlap, but they are not the same thing. Some of the differences, the major difference, includes human trafficking is always a crime against a person, whereas human smuggling is a, most always a crime against a border. It involves transporting people across borders, whether it's an international border or you know, there can be smuggling, I, I suppose, between you know, different states in our country. But it always involves transportation and it's, it's a crime against the border, whereas human trafficking is a crime against a person. Um, as I mentioned before, victims don't consent to what's going on in the situation. And it's against a person's fundamental human rights. In Kansas, a lot of people are interested in knowing what's going on in our state in Kansas. Um, as the Attorney General mentioned in his video, that more than 83% of human trafficking involves domestic victims. That's a very high number, and it's often surprising for people to learn. Um, a lot of people think uh, that human trafficking is um, foreign-born victims being smuggled or trafficked in the United States. And while we do see some of that, that is human trafficking, that is, as you can see, is not the majority of the human trafficking going on in our country, uh, and not the majority that's going on in our state. Um, the majority of the victims in Kansas are children. That's not unique to Kansas. That's, that's happening all over the United States. Um, what that means, though, is the most trafficking in Kansas is involving local victims. Children or women or men are being trafficked in our own communities. Oftentimes, they're taken out of their community of origin and um, moved to another state. Uh, or clear across the country, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, because of this, Kansas has adopted new laws that seek to protect and rescue human trafficking victims. Since, since you're saying children, mm -hmm. what, what age does that mean? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the average age um, a child is lured into human trafficking, and it'll surprise you, I think. Um, Kansas is a major source of victims nationally. We are an origination state. The Department of Justice has identified Kansas as an originating state for victims of human trafficking. What that means is, is that um, young boys and girls and women are often um, taken in Kansas and moved to the Kansas City and Wichita areas, and then also moved to other cities in the Midwest. There's a human trafficking loop that runs north, south, and east, west in our country on the major cities. It starts in Minneapolis and goes down to St. Louis, Kansas City, Wichita, Oklahoma City, Houston, New Orleans, and then back up again. There's also loops that go east-west. And they hit the major metropolitan areas. Why? Because that's where the customers are. That's just the fact. Uh, so, runaways are very vulnerable to becoming victims of human trafficking. That's fairly understandable. They run away from home, they hit the street, they're homeless, they are very vulnerable and very desperate for food, shelter, and general, general needs, comforts and needs. And so when someone offers these things to them, um, you know, they're desperate and they'll take them, often not knowing what the price will be. Um, runaways are often picked up and transported to cities, as I mentioned, larger cities even than Kansas City and forced into prostitution within 48 hours of hitting the street. That's two days. That's a very, very quick time to be swept up and caught up into this type of a situation. Um, something that's really surprising to a lot of people, uh, there was a study done back in 1999. It's an older study, but it's still noteworthy. Over a five-year period, 33 out of 262 children who were identified as working as prostitutes in New York City um, identify themselves as coming from our state. 
that's that's interesting, isn't it? It really is. So we, we, we find that very noteworthy, and we'd like to get to the bottom of why that is the case. Why Kansas? Well, as we all know, because we live here, it's very centrally located. Um, there's a lot of commerce that happens across our interstates. We've got um, I-70 that goes that direction. We've got I-35 that cuts down through. We're really at a crossroads. And a lot of times, um, some of our truck stops along these major interstates serve as exchange points for pimps or traffickers who are moving victims across the country. They'll stop at one of these truck stops and they will exchange victims. And um, based on information that, you know, with victims and victim service agencies that we work with, sometimes these victims' feet never even touch Kansas soil. They're just transported from truck to truck or car to car. So it's really a problem at the truck stops along the interstates in our state. Where in our communities would you see human trafficking? Some of these are fairly cliche, not surprising. Um, massage parlors, as I mentioned, truck stops. Uh, there's a lot of activity in truck stops. Streets on the street. There is still traditional you know, activity going on um, on the street level. However, later in my presentation, I'll really describe to you how technology has changed how this looks. The, the previous prostitution is no longer just on the streets. It's really on the internet. Um, adult websites, that's where it is on the internet. Some of these websites are um, advertising and arranging, um, arranging dates with victims. Drug houses, again, fairly predictable within families. Um, sometimes the trafficker is not a stranger, is not a pimp or a trafficker that you would, the media depicts, that our culture, that sort of thing. Sometimes it's a family member who is trafficking their own child or a relative, a niece or a nephew. So it's not always a stranger who is the trafficker. Uh, street gangs, strip clubs, escort and dating services, and in our schools. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> the internet, as I mentioned, just a huge area of activity for human trafficking. Um, Facebook is, is re has really Facebook and Backpage.com, which a lot of folks have never heard of. That's a good thing if you haven't heard of Backpage.com. That's where a lot of this activity goes on, where victims are, pictures are posted, um, there's you know a phone number that's given to arrange a date, and these victims, when they're moved from town to town, state to state, uh, the trafficker posts an ad, posts an ad, a picture of the victim with the phone number to call and set up the date. Um, and a lot of times, when law enforcement is searching for a victim, when a child has been reported missing or something, law enforcement can then go online and look at Backpage.com and try to track down these mostly girls but some boys um, who are missing. So technology can work um, in a bad way, uh, but it can also work in a good way to help rescue some of the victims. So it kind of goes back both ways. Some of these websites that I mentioned here are the most um, well-known um, for activity, for human trafficking activity. I mentioned in our schools, and, and again, that's always something kind of surprising for people to hear. This is um, part of a newspaper article uh, from several years ago where um, a prominent athlete in a Wichita high school was um, convicted of human trafficking. He and his father had a human trafficking ring going on in um, northern Oklahoma. And the high school student, his job was to recruit girls from his high school and take them down to his dad's house in Oklahoma across the border, and then they were being um, pimped out to customers. This, you know, fortunately was, was caught and um, was prosecuted in federal court. But this does go on. It, it very much goes on. And sometimes high school girls who are involved in human trafficking, um, a lot of times victims of human trafficking who are of the middle school and high school age are still attending school. They're not always taken out of the area. Sometimes they're still attending school because they met somebody who they think is their boyfriend and that person is exploiting them and asking them to do things um, to help earn money for them as a couple and things like that. It's a very manipulative situation. But sometimes these girls who are involved in human trafficking who are of school age are then used to recruit other girls into that group. So it's a kind of a, 
It's a very bad situation. Um, data on human trafficking is very elusive. It's very hard to grasp because of the underground nature of this crime. Um, it's not easily identified. Um, so we, we struggle with how to get, and I say we, those of us who work in anti-human trafficking efforts, not just Kansas and not just the Attorney General's office, but as a, as a country, um, those of us in this business struggle with trying to get a real um, handle on um, accurate and complete data on, on human trafficking activity in our state and in our country. And why that is, as I mentioned, is because of the underground nature of the crime. What we do know is, based on some data that we have been able to get, that children represent 26% of the millions of victims worldwide. Um, and as we talked about, both U.S. citizen and foreign national children are trafficked for sex and for labor in our country. Um, each year, it's a very large number of children are at risk. And I'm going to go into um, some of the risk indicators for children being caught up in human trafficking in a minute. That's a very high number, and it's, it's concerning to everybody, I'm sure. The average age a girl enters the commercial sex trade is 12 to 14. That's middle school age, and the average age for boys is even a little bit younger. Those are our middle schoolers. Um, this issue is particularly um, kind of raw and meaningful to me because I have three teenage kids. I'm a single mom, and I have three teenagers in my house. One is at college, but my daughter is a senior in high school. And then I have a 13-year-old um, son who's in eighth grade. So these issues are very real, um, and they're very um, upsetting to think about as a parent. I'm sure most of you in the room are also parents or have had children that age at one point or have grandchildren even at that age that are at risk for being caught up in this because of our culture and because of what's going on. Many child victims of human trafficking are students in the American school system. Like I said, a lot of times these kids stay in school. I'll mention too on that, training that our office does on human trafficking, we come and we do, I, I do a lot of public presentations for awareness so the general public can become aware and help um, alert law enforcement so we can rescue these victims. But I also do, my colleague and I also do a lot of training with healthcare professionals um, who see a lot of victims in the emergency room with school administrators, school nurses, school counselors, folks that are really on the front line and can help identify victims and lead them to law enforcement. Um, some of the other statistics that we have for Kansas, the Polaris um, Project is a national organization that, that runs a hotline that's answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, <clears throat> and they report statistics on how many calls from each state each year. So last year in 2014, during that time frame, there were 321 calls to the national hotline from somebody in Kansas. Now, I will say these were not all victims calling asking for rescue. Sometimes people call and just need information on human trafficking or want to volunteer to help. Those calls are logged as well. But that, that's a fairly high volume of, of calls for, for our population. Um, in 2013, we had three convictions, one way out in Logan County, out in Oakley, Kansas. Um, and two in Sedgwick County. Uh, Wichita and the Sedgwick County area is a very high activity uh, area for human trafficking. And again, I mentioned that loop goes right down through there on the way to Oklahoma City and down to Houston. They have a lot of sex trafficking in the Wichita area. Uh, they also have a lot of excellent uh, service providers and um, resources there to deal with the problem. But Sedgwick County, they have something called the Exploited and Missing Children's Unit. That's what EMCU stands for. And they are a um, hybrid of law enforcement, um, special investigators, and Department for Children and Family social workers. And they work together. And that's a great model uh, you know, that, that we'd like to see more of across the state. But they do a lot of work with victims. Um, and they had 28 cases in 2013, and 29 cases were reported in 2014. These statistics come from our office. Um, we have grants that we give out across the state to victim service agencies um, in communities and towns across Kansas. And we had nine um, victim service agencies receiving human trafficking grants and then another 12 that received other kinds of um, domestic violence or sexual assault related grants um, 
over the years. And we asked them, have you seen any victims, have you provided any services of, of folks that you believe to be victims of human trafficking? And as you can see, when we first asked them in 2009, a couple of folks, you know, they, they reported, yeah, maybe one, maybe two. Well, then you, you trace this trend, and in 2014, um, we, we had agencies reporting the total was 352 victims. Now, a lot of people think that's concerning, and, I, and it, it probably does indicate increased human trafficking activity in our state. However, I, I really believe, based on the work I do, I also think it's increased awareness by those who treat victims. When someone comes in and, and it appears to be domestic violence, or sometimes it can be both domestic violence and sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Um, but I really think that, that service providers and others who are, they're really becoming educated and understanding what human trafficking is. So that's why the numbers are growing as well. It's not just um, increased activity. So I like to explain that so people don't panic. <clears throat> So those 352 victims that were identified by our grantees, um, what, what can I tell you about them? Well, they, they were from 20 agencies um, in 15 cities and surrounding areas in Kansas. Um, the breakdown were 60 children were served either as primary victims or secondary victims, which would mean possibly their mother brought them in um, to a shelter and had been trafficked and they were served as well because they were a dependent of the victim. So that doesn't necessarily say that they're the victim. 292 adult victims. That's a high number of women and a few men. 84% <clears throat> were domestic and 16% were international or foreign born. Most of them were female. Um, the types of services that were offered to these victims were counseling, um, a follow-up contact such as a referral or an appointment to come back um, for another appointment. Sometimes they, they run support groups for victims of human trafficking. Um, court advocacy, that's a huge need for victims of human trafficking. They need help. A lot of them have, um, if they're foreign born, they have immigration issues or if they're in a criminal case, they need help sorting out if they're going to testify against the person who was exploiting them or not. So legal services are always a very high need. <coughs> and very interestingly, um, at the bottom, 33%, um, the spouse or the partner was identified as the trafficker. So like I said, it's not always the stranger who is the perpetrator. Sometimes it's the spouse or the boyfriend or the girlfriend um, who's, who's exploiting the victim. So let's talk a little bit about what a human trafficking victim looks like. Um, this graphic is something I found interesting because it really sort of debunks some of the myths that the media, you know, that we see on TV or whatever about human trafficking, sex trafficking specifically. Um, some of them do walk freely, you know, in, in our worlds and we're not aware that they're being victimized. Um, a lot of them are lured in by dreams of a better life. Um, some of the law enforcement down in Wichita, the, have said before, if these kids or young women are running from something into sex trafficking, how bad must be the thing that they're running from? Wow. I mean, if that's your best option, you're coming from a really difficult, bad situation. Um, again, the average age of entry is 12 to 14. The majority of victims are runaway and youth within the foster care system. That is a very common denominator, or in Child Protective Services. Some of them, though, do come from wealth and prosperity, middle-class kids. The, the stories that seem to get all the media attention are the stories of these, you know, usually Caucasian middle-class or upper-middle-class girls who were the cheerleader, who were the, you know, had a prominent position in school and then were whisked away somehow into this world of human trafficking. And yeah, that, that does happen, but that's not really the majority of the situations that we see. Something that is very, very common amongst the victims that we see is 70 to 90 percent of sexually exploited children have a history of child and sexual abuse. <laughs> so the fire No, that was the key out the wrong door. Oh, I was like, oh, the law is going to be smell smoke. That's right. Uh, I mentioned that, I really highlight that because it's extremely important to understand 
that children who become caught up in this commercial exploitation um, have a history of childhood sexual abuse, either by a parent, by an uncle, by an aunt, by, by someone they don't know, maybe a neighbor or a pastor or something like that. We hear about these stories. They're not fun to talk about, but they do exist. So that's a high, high number, and that's something that, that those of us who work in anti-human trafficking really look at as far as um, um, prevention. How do we attack this before it happens? How do we get at it from a preventive um, position? Most are female, and they're not likely to consider themselves as a victim. What does that mean? Well, like I said, a lot of this is based on coercion and manipulation. And the trafficker will um, profess their love or really manipulate. And these victims are very vulnerable. They're, they're kids who don't have a good family life. They don't have you know, a lot of things going for them. They're very, very open to attention of any kind. So, that, so a lot of them don't consider themselves victims. And this makes it incredibly difficult for law enforcement and others, victim service agencies, to help these, these folks. Because they don't want to help. A lot of the time they think they're fine, you know, we're, everything's great. No, he's just, you know. But the fact is, is that, you know, they're being exploited. So that makes it a challenge to help and rescue victims. Child exploitation, you know, as I mentioned, ch children are very vulnerable to the effects of these crimes in different ways than adults are. Um, and, and children's brains don't even mature completely until age 22. I think that's the, the age that, that the psychiatrists and psychologists have determined is you know, maturity in terms of decision making. So you, you know, these folks get caught up in things and they're not really able to handle and make the right decisions. Um, teens are from all different ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, there's really not one group that's more at risk than another. Uh, traffickers recruit based on psychological and emotional vulnerabilities. I've talked about that. Uh, there was a study done online where investigators monitored a very large sample of teens um, who were being targeted by traffickers online. None of the teens have reported this. So again, they don't consider themselves victims. A lot of them aren't mature or able to really understand what's going on. And as a mother of teenagers, especially girls, Boy, is that you can't tell a 17, almost 18 year old girl, hey, you know, you, they think they know it all, right? I mean, <laughs> so that's not surprising to me one bit. What types of crimes or child, childhood, child sexual exploitation crimes that are internet based in, in our <coughs> technology? We, we tend to look at these for clues and, and to try to find, hunt this stuff down. Child pornography, all different aspects of child pornography. Um, as I mentioned before, intrafamilial trafficking, when a family member is the trafficker, um, that happens online and offline. Cyber enticement, which is you know, really the grooming process, that's the term that's used where they give gifts and money and promise all these things <clears throat> that a very vulnerable uh, person finds attractive. Child sex tourism, that is, that is going on on an international level, I think there's been a lot of that in the media recently, but also nationally, um, you know, it really does link to child porn and, you know, online pornography. Um, but, but that also is going on and on, on the internet. So what are some of the obstacles or challenges in identifying victims of human trafficking? What types of things make it difficult to, to get them the help they need? Well, as I mentioned, they almost never self-identify as trafficking victims. Victims of this particular crime do not go down to the police department and knock on the door and say, you know, like a victim of a robbery or a burglary or, you know, some of those sorts of things and say, I, I've been victimized and can you help me? Not with this crime and that makes it very, very challenging. Um, the victim in this instance mostly views the trafficker as the boyfriend and there's a lot of trauma bonding that goes on in these types of relationships, very unhealthy. Um, the fear of retaliation. Um, when gangs are involved in human trafficking, which again, I mentioned Wichita, there's been a lot of gang activity down there. The threats are real. These folks are threatening these girls' pets, family members, um, and sometimes those threats are carried out. So there's a lot of fear involved with victims and that keeps them quiet and keeps them from asking for help. They're lured into a false sense of choice, thinking that, no, I just want to help this person, I just want to help get money so we can live a better life, that, that kind of thing. Um, they may have been given a new name 
or been branded, and I'm going to show you what branding means in just a minute, but I'm sure you can imagine, based on what, what we know in our state, with branding of cattle and things of that nature, um, they're conditioned to view others as family. Sometimes, in that story that I shared with you about the Wichita student and his father down in Oklahoma, they had a whole ring going on where there were five to ten girls who were being trafficked. A lot of times, the dynamics that go on in these groups are they are one big family. There's a lot of manipulation and a lot of loyalty issues going on there, so that makes it really hard, too. And most of these folks don't have a traditional family at home, so that to them is family. Very fearful of law enforcement. Um, reasoning behind that, you know, might be obvious. Law enforcement, are they going to get into trouble? But also, sometimes the law enforcement has um, contributed to the problem by um, you know, asking for sexual favors or other things too, that actually does go on as well. So sometimes law enforcement are not seen, maybe they've had a really bad experience in the past um, or been picked up on the street and they're afraid of what could happen. Um, these folks are also really street smart and difficult to interview. They don't want to cooperate um, with forensic interviewers, they don't, they don't want to talk to you, they don't want anything to do with, with someone trying to help them. While that is true, there are still some services that are absolutely critical um, to protect children especially, but also um, adult victims of exploitation. Um, most of them who present, especially the ones who present in like an emergency room setting, have really acute medical needs. They also could have a chronic health problem like asthma or um, diabetes or something like that, that they have been with a trafficker in this group traveling around on the road these guys aren't giving them their insulin. I mean, you know, they, they, they're, they've been neglected. Their medical needs have been neglected, and then they, that, sometimes that's how they finally get rescued. They have to go to the ER because their chronic health problem is blown up, and now it's an emergency. So when we do our trainings with ER workers, you know, it, it's a really good opportunity to be able to help identify and give them some referrals to get them out. Um, safety planning. Um, you know, where are you going to go after this if you're not going to go back to where you, the trafficker where can you go to safe shelters? Treatment for major trauma and complex post-traumatic stress disorder, not surprising based on what I've told you is going on in a lot of these situations, but not just short-term treatment, long-term counseling and psychological treatment is often needed. Housing, that's an issue in our state of Kansas that we're really struggling with on the policy level. How do we provide enough adequate and safe housing for minor victims of human trafficking. Right now, we have one identified um, facility called a staff secure facility. It's a designation, a state designation. Um, the Department of Children and Families, they're licensed through KDHE. They, and right now, we have one facility at the Wichita Children's Home down in Wichita that has four beds that are available anytime for human trafficking victims that are minors. And they've had a steady stream of victims in there since it was licensed and started operating, I believe July 1st of 2014. So there is a huge need when police pick up these victims and want to help them, if they don't have somewhere to put them that's safe, what are they going to do? They don't have a choice. Sometimes, you know, they go back to where they came from. Or a lot of the victims, though, have other criminal um, charges that are, that are pending. They're not, you know, they're not always clean slate. And when that's the case, it gets even more complicated because part of the new law, and I'll get into that in a moment, is we want to treat these victims like victims and not like criminals. So there's some challenges that are involved with that. Um, <clears throat> assistance dealing with and testifying against a trafficker, I mentioned that before, uh, addiction treatment, boy, um, you know, drugs and alcohol are used by um, traffickers to get compliance and get, get cooperation by the victims. So, so the majority of victims that end up getting treatment are addicted to some sort of substance. Some of the older victims who are adult victims need employment assistance. So they've been rescued and they've gotten some short-term help and you know they're clean, they're not addicted anymore, and they're ready to step out. What are they going to do with themselves? I mean, what kind of education? A lot of them are taken out of school or don't have high school diplomas, certainly don't have college. How are they then going to re-enter society and be productive citizens and not become desperate so they go right back to that, quote, easy money? It, it's, a, it's a very um, 
very difficult situation. So employment assistance and other specific assistance based on the case. So we talked a little bit about the victim. What does a trafficker look like? In your mind, I'm sure you can come up with a stereotype. And that, while that is true, like I said, sometimes traffickers are the parents or another family member. Here are some pictures of actual convicted traffickers in Kansas. And when I look at that myself, you know, some of them do fit the stereotype, but, you know, other people look like, you know, someone I went to college with, or, you know, you really just don't know. What we do know about these folks, some of the characteristics that are common is that they're usually between the age of 19 and 45. Um, they have a low level of education. Um, they have a very high, uh, level of uh, percentage of drug or alcohol use and a very high percentage of being involved in other crimes in the past. And a lot of them have criminal records and the bottom statistic is kind of mind-blowing for a lot of people. They make, you know, the average salary of people who, who do this kind of thing is, you know, almost half a million dollars a year. So think about that. That's just, I mean, that's craziness. But that also makes this a very dangerous situation and, and when I get to what you can do as citizens, the thing you cannot do is specifically intervene if you think you see this out on the street. And that's that's a major reason why, because these folks are protecting a huge financial asset. And that always makes for a very, very dangerous situation. Some other things uh, that we know about traffickers or pimps based on a study that was done, um, you can see here, I won't read them all to you, but some of them mimic what I told you in the other slide. Um, what is, Interesting, I think, 76% um, were sexually abused in their own childhoods. So you've got victims victimizing others. And that's a very common thing in any kind of victimization, not just human trafficking. Folks that were victimized and didn't work through it and didn't get help then go on to victimize others. One real common form of this is bullying, right? The bullier is usually the person who was bullied. So that, that's kind of a parallel. Um, a lot of them grew up with domestic violence in their home or witnessed substance abuse in their home. So they actually have a lot of things in common with the victims. So child trafficking, the two types of child trafficking that we see are, as we've talked a lot about, the child sex trafficking. Um, that can come in different forms, stripping, pornography, um, forced prostitution. Child labor trafficking, I haven't really talked as much about that, but I do want to talk about it because we see that in Kansas, especially the traveling sales crews. Whenever I talk to groups and I talk about, and I mention the phrase traveling sales crews, someone is always shaking their head saying, yes, I don't know if you all have seen that in Independence, if you all have had problems with traveling sales crews. What they are is, um, I live in Lawrence, and we have a tremendous problem with traveling sales crews. Um, what, what it looks like is like a white van, usually with no windows, will pull up in a neighborhood, usually a pretty prosperous neighborhood, and open the doors, and these kids, and when I say kids, they're usually 16 to 25. They're not young kids like the sex trafficking victims. They're older teens or young adults. A lot of them are developmentally disabled. That's who's recruited into these traveling sales crews. And they are promised money, and we'll, we'll feed you, we'll house you. All you have to do is go door to door and sell a variety of things, magazines, candy, you know, all these kinds of things. And, you know, in Lawrence, on a weekend, you can get a couple different knocks on your door of these folks. And they even have a badge, and, it, you know, it's a picture ID, and a lot of them wear the same color golf shirt, like blue, you know, so they all sort of, and you'll see them on the corners with clipboards, you know, after they've gone to the houses, they're trying to, and really what we've learned, the Department of Labor, we work very closely with on tracking down these traveling sales crews, because these kids are not allowed to leave. Once they sign up and they get involved in this, you know, you can make a lot of money, you don't go to college, you do this for a few years and then earn enough money to go to college. It sounds very attractive. But what we've learned is they are, it's the common thing, they are being exploited, they are not allowed to leave the situation, they are not free to leave, their cell phones are taken, their identification is taken upon signing up, and they are completely at the will of the traffickers. And then the traffickers tend to be a couple kind of a middle-aged couple who run this outfit. So if you all haven't seen them here, that's, that's good, but boy, they're, they're all over the state. They really are. I've seen You've them. seen them, so you know what I'm talking about. So that's child labor trafficking. 
also involuntary domestic servitude, underage agricultural labor out in the southwest part of our state. There's a lot of that going on. Um, we heard a report a couple weeks ago about a train going through the, near the liberal area. Kids are jumping off the train and going, being enrolled in the local schools there. And who knows where they're coming from and they're not with an adult. And I mean, it's just been craziness. So they're there to work at the meatpacking plants. So got some of the, you know, because of our large agriculture industry here, we have a lot of that going on and a lot down in the southwest corner. Peddling or begging, um, those sorts of things. And also something that would go under chi child labor trafficking is the whole nannying industry, you know, the glamorous au pair nanny thing. Sometimes that's not really legit. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes these girls are brought over, or our girls are sent over to other countries to be the nanny, but they're asked to do some other stuff that's not not okay. So we see it in that. Or the girl at the um, who goes to the mall with her friends and is told she's pretty, don't you want to be a model? That would fall under, that would overlap actually between sex and labor job. So these are some examples of what it actually looks like. So who is vulnerable? Again, when, I, when we look at human trafficking, as you can see, it's such a large and complex issue. It's important for us to try to figure out vulnerabilities so that maybe we can do preventive work um, with kids in schools so they don't end up being ensnared into this in the first place. Chronic runaways. Some of these I've already mentioned. Children who are suffering serious abuse in their own homes. Like I said, if they're running from something to go to this, it must be really bad where they're coming from. The throwaway children, that's a, that's a term or a phrase. Children who are runaways who are never reported missing. And that's, as a parent, again, that's very hard to even comprehend, but it happens. Um, kids run away from home, fight with parents, parents never call them in, never report them missing. And then they're found in these bad situations. Missing and homeless children, throwaway children who age out of the system. So these kids who run, who were never reported missing, who then turn 18. Now they're no longer within our social service system in the state. So that they are ineligible for services. What are they doing? Well, they're in some really bad situations and they need services and help. So that's, they're extremely vulnerable um, to this sort of thing. And then of course the 6% of all girls in Kansas who have a developmental disability, um, very vulnerable to this sort of thing. You know, not able to judge social cues and all those things that we know about kids who have autism or another developmental delay. Um, not being able to read a situation, not being able to understand what's really going on. They are extremely vulnerable. For labor trafficking, you know, vulnerabilities are a little bit different, but we've talked a lot about most of these things. Um, see if there's any construction, landscaping, again, some other industries where labor trafficking goes on. So what kinds of kids are at risk for human trafficking? This is a list that was given to us at a national training that we went to. And I always put it in a slide, and I'll, the next slide will tell you why. But let's look at some of these things. Very, very common things. Again, as a mother of three teens, I can tell you my kids can check almost everything else on this list. So the answer to this is all children are at risk. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. Some really specific risk factors, um, the lack of social support is huge. A lot of the victims, they don't have a social network. They don't have a safety net, someone to go and talk to, either a family member or someone at school that they really trust they can talk to if something bad is going on. Um, a lot of them are very isolated. Um, they don't have a lot of friends, um, family dysfunction. Um, we talked about something, lack of personal safety and the childhood sexual abuse. So what are the red flags or the indicators? What would you look for if you thought someone might be um, a victim of human trafficking? What do I tell my school administrators, uh, my nurses at the community clinic, that sort of thing? These are some things, these are from the US Department of Education, so they're really kind of geared to school situations or school age kids, but they're very important. Um, now, I will caution, one or two of these alone doesn't mean you need to call the police, of course. But these are things that could be indicators 
a large group of them would really be reason to ask more questions or to refer somebody to services. Um, bruises, other signs of physical trauma, we haven't really talked about that, but a lot of these victims do have either new or old injuries that, that haven't been treated. Um, I talk to my medical professionals a lot about that. Um, a lot of anxiety or fear, not surprising, hunger, malnourishment, or inappropriate dress. So in the winter time, what that means is if you see a girl walking down Main Street in the winter time with a very short skirt and a tank top on, I mean, that, again, on its own, that doesn't mean they're a victim of human trafficking. But if there's some other things that, that could be indicators, that, that could be something if they're malnourished and hungry. A lot of times, traffickers or pimps use food to manipulate. You know, you don't get dinner unless you bring home this amount of money or what have you. So food is often used in that way. Um, a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's noticeably older, um, you know, that could be a control issue which could be behind a co coercion situation. Um, sudden change in entire material possessions. School administrators talk about this where Susie Smith, you know, used to be fairly modest dressed and all those kinds of things and then they've noticed over a couple of months now she's got designer purses or nails are always done. She's wearing kind of provocative clothing. That would be a reason to maybe try to talk to Susie and see what else is going on at home or whatever. Um, tattoos, brandy, I'm going to show you some examples of that in a minute. Um, not living with immediate family. Sometimes why well, I live with the person where I, where I work. That's something probably to ask some more questions about. This is what we talk about when we say the word branding. Um, it is sort of like branding, like cattle, because it has to do with tattoos. And these are all pictures of tattoos that were taken of victims of human trafficking in our state, mostly in Wichita. Um, you'll notice a lot of them are men's names or numbers. Um, it was trendy. Um, recently, I've seen a lot in the media with people getting barcodes on the back of their neck. I mean, it's degrading, it's demeaning, um, and a lot of times these victims, once they get finally rescued or out of the life, they don't want that constant visual reminder of their exploitation. And so, something neat that's really being done now that I've heard, not, not locally, but I have heard in other um, national stories, are tattoo parlors who are providing free service to victims who want to have their tattoos redone, which means you could turn one of these ugly, demeaning, degrading symbols or names or signs into a beautiful flower or a butterfly or something. So, you know, there are things that these folks can do, but this is what branding looks like. Sometimes it's a phrase, it's a gang sign, it's a name. The person who's the trafficker sometimes brands his girls with his name. And that is a sign to other pimps or traffickers that that property belongs to them. Um, but like I said, it's a very demeaning act. So I want to talk a little bit about recruitment and how teens especially are being pulled into this. Um, <coughs> traffickers are setting up big accounts online to friend teens, and that's all about Facebook. And the next slide, I believe, is the video I want to show you. It's brief um, that CNN Money did last year, and it interviews a girl who was recruited uh, on Facebook, and she kind of walks you through exactly how it happened. Um, I do a lot of talks at high schools and middle schools, and that's very interesting to them, and I like to show it so they're sure they understand what can happen. Um, I talked a little bit about traffickers using other teens who are already in, in the life to scout and recruit new teens. She talks about that in the video. Um, so, in that, I will show you this brief video. It started with a friend request on Facebook. My mentality was, he's cute, let me accept him. And then, once I would accept him, they would message me. They quickly developed a relationship. He sold me the biggest dream in the world. You know, I thought, like, he really did like me, and we were going to live this fairy tale life together. What she got was a nightmare. <clears throat> Pretty much, she was like, I'm going to put you outside, and you're going to walk and catch things. I was okay with it because I liked him. He wanted to spend the rest of his life with me, wanted to have kids. He really made it believable. In a mouse click, Nina became part of the growing number of victims recruited into sex trafficking on social networks. The other end of her friend request? A pimp. I personally have been 
beaten with a pistol. <laughs> um, I've been duct taped and put in the closet for 24 hours. The money part. I think I wanted money, that's why I did it. Lisa, who asked us to hide her identity, was trafficked for much of her life. She's free now, but still receives more than 20 messages a day from pimps. Hey, what's up? What's up, you cutie? What's up? What's you boo? Pimps are now using many different social networks to do everything from connect to brag about money. Oftentimes there's lots of pictures of just money. Almost all of our girls who we're working with now, age 11 all the way up to 22, they are being recruited online. This Facebook, it's tagged, which a lot of people don't know, is sort of like, I call it like the creepy Facebook. And then um, Twitter, actually, Instagram to a smaller degree. Andrea Powell's organization, FAIR, locates and rescues trafficked women like Nina. Pimps will look for girls who are really looking isolated. So girls who are maybe dressed provocatively, or look like they only have uh, a few friends. Miners will friend people whether they know them or not, just to appear to be popular. And somebody who is a pimp can use that information to start, um, start looking at what makes a person tick. Pimps were doing exactly that in Virginia's affluent Fairfax County, revealed in a major 2012 case. Gang members were using social networking sites like Facebook to solicit women. One of the defendants sent over 800 solicitations on Facebook, many to women still in high school. The U.S. attorney prosecuting that case says social media has spurred a new class of crime. The use of social media to recruit young girls into the sex trade uh, is definitely on the rise. Pre-internet, if they had sent a letter to a young girl saying, hey, you're cute, we think you should come work for us, um, it, it, it strikes me as impossible that that approach would have ever worked. So a crime like this, I think, simply couldn't have happened uh, 15 or, or 20 years ago. One common move, having a woman reach out. I used to have to sit next to my ex-pimp and help him recruit girls. But those same pages used to recruit are also used to rescue. I can also go and see who all I like to help with, and that can lead me out looking for girls who look like they need help. Law enforcement sources say that Facebook reacts swiftly when notified of illicit activity on specific accounts. Facebook says it takes human trafficking very seriously and has built complex technical systems to flag and block <coughs> such material. Tag.com says it has numerous tech and educational tools to empower and protect users and has a dedicated team to respond to unauthorized conduct on the site. Nina and Lisa, whose names were changed to protect their identities, are both still on the social networks where they were recruited. Nina says she's no longer looking for a boyfriend on Facebook. More pimps tell you the same thing, you kind of get the clue. And, you know, life's not a fairy tale. Lisa starts school this semester. When she enrolls, she plans to log out of Facebook for good. Lori Siegel, CNN Money, New York. Okay, so you see why I wanted to show you that. by talking briefly about demand because it's an extremely important part of this. And this here shows you why. So when you think about sex trafficking specifically, that is representative of the numbers. So you've got the smallest circle, which is the pimps and the traffickers. Then you have the number of victims. Then it's the buyers. It's simple supply and demand, as with any issue. If you didn't have a high demand for something, there wouldn't be a large supply. I mean, it's, it's so because of that, and because, you know, that's, there's no way of denying that. It's, it's a part of the equation for human trafficking that absolutely has to be dealt with. It's challenging, though, on how to deal with that issue for a number of reasons. There have been a number of successful initiatives within our country that do combat demand. Some of the most innovative ones are um, John schools. That's something that our office is looking very closely at in the state of Kansas. Um, possibly um, developing curriculum for a John school, which consists of many different things. It's a, usually an eight hour, one day program. Um, I've been to one, I've seen it. They had uh, one in Kansas City for a while that was being offered as a sentencing alternative. And we're talking about those who have been arrested 
for um, sex trafficking of adults, not of minors or children. That, that really requires an entirely different and more serious uh, course of action. But for those who continue to frequent um, women in the commercial sex industry, um, these John schools have been shown to reduce recidiv recidivism by up to 40%. So it's something we're looking at possibly putting together and piloting across the state in, in a couple of the different judicial districts as a sentencing option. Um, and these are some of the things that are covered in the one-day program. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the person, the John, who has been sent to John School uh, is asked to pay a fee, and that fee then pays for the entire John School. So it's sort of a, you know, the money, the person who did the crime is then paying to support the fix, which that's kind of a neat way. It's a restorative justice program. They go over the health and the safety risks of, of buying commercial sex. Um, a lot of these folks have addiction issues, whether it's drug, alcohol, a lot of it's porn. Uh, so they talk a little bit about that, the impact on a community. What, what, what happens to a community when you have this going on? Um, there's some real uh, impact. Survivors panel, where they bring in the survivor and someone who has gotten out of this life. But they sometimes, sometimes the men who attend these programs aren't aware of, of, of what these women have gone through. They, they just, to see a real person up there talking, describing uh, the difficulties in their life, et cetera, it can really make a, make a heavy impact. The legal consequences um, and the connection to trafficking and other crimes. A lot of times, folks that are involved in this are also then involved with other crimes. Um, but as I mentioned, until demand is eliminated, this sort of thing will continue, and that's just a fact. How about the casinos? How does that play into it? Too? There have been. We, we do work with some of the um, groups who run the casinos, and yes, that does go on there. It does. It's definitely a location where they have, and they of course have a whole different culture there, and you know that that brings in a lot of other issues that have to be addressed. Briefly, I want to touch on this before I, I open it up to questions. Um, as I mentioned, um, in response to this this large problem of human trafficking, not just in our state but in in many states, what we're concerned about is how how do we tackle this? What do we do to make it more difficult? Uh, how do we really crack down on this? So in 2013. Uh, a package of bills was passed in the Kansas, Kansas legislature. Um, Attorney General Schmidt was very involved in crafting these bills. He's been working on this issue for many years, including when he was in the, the Kansas Senate. Um, one of the things it did was the Human Trafficking Advisory Board um, has been around since 2010, but this bill made it the official state advisory board on human trafficking in our state. It's composed of members. We have about 45 members of this board. We meet quarterly. Um, I staff the board as well as my colleague. It's made up of members of law enforcement from across the state. We have two judges from different judicial districts in the state who drive all the way to Topeka once a quarter to sit and to discuss these issues. Um, we have prosecutors, court personnel, um, advocates, social service providers who are actually the folks that are treating the victims. Um, and other educators, we have representatives from all the major universities, we have medical uh, personnel, and most importantly, we have survivors of human trafficking who are on our board, who can say, if we're discussing a policy or an issue, hey, that's not really how it is, let me tell you how it is. It's very important to include those folks in decision making and policy formation. Um, this new package of laws also created the Anti-Human Trafficking Unit within the Attorney General's Office. That, that's new. Uh, it's only existed since 2013, and that's how I got to the Attorney General's Office, um, was to work in that unit. As I said, I do that work, and then I'm also the press person and the spokesperson. Um, the unit, well, that's pretty much why we're there. We're really there to implement this package of new laws. Um, we work a lot with social service agencies who are doing the rescuing. We, as the unit, don't go out on the street and rescue the girls. That's not the part we do, but we work real closely with the folks that do. We do a lot of training. As I mentioned, we've trained over 2,000 law enforcement officers across Kansas have been trained in some of the same things you guys are learning tonight, but more in depth in how it can be applicable to them. Um, the new law recognizes the victimization of minors who are commercially exploited, even when they don't think that they're victims. As I mentioned, that's a huge obstacle to getting uh, victims help. It also created a new law in our statutes. 
and this is called the commercial sexual exploitation of a child. Um, it applies to anyone who promotes the sale of sexual relations or anyone who buys from a person under the age of 18. Something else interesting that our new laws do, it eliminates the words prostitute or prostitution from the Kansas statutes. That is a huge um, thing for a lot of these victims and survivors. They don't want to be called prostitutes. They don't want, you know, that's not, you know, they want to be treated as victims because a lot of them who are now over 18 started, got pulled into this as we talked about when they were under 18. Um, created some new crimes, we've increased penalties, and we've put some mandatory fines on buyers, um, which then fund a victim assistance fund, which that money is then granted out to the grantees that I mentioned at the beginning who are doing the victim services. So we like to try to do it that way. But the main point of the new laws is to treat the victims as victims, <coughs> have them seen as victims and not criminals. So what is an effective response to human trafficking? As I'm sure you've learned, it's a very complicated issue. It's not a simple black and white issue. These are, these are some of the goals of the response. It's appropriate. Restore a sense of safety, reduce the effects of trauma, um, especially in minor victims, reestablish future dreams and goals. These kids, you know, really are, are devastated and need a lot of help with that. Um, and then the, the adult victims, helping them return as vital productive community members. And like I said, a lot of times that involves, you know, job skills, um, other types of, of social skills so they can get jobs and, and return to the community. So what, when we look to the future, what can we do to help eradicate this huge and pervasive problem in our communities? And again, not just our communities, but all across the country. Um, it's really important that community agencies and groups work together. Um, and that includes pub the public and regular citizens learning about human trafficking and how to identify it and how to report it. I'm going to give you some resources in a minute. But we like to keep a shared focus on victim safety um, and, and work together. So as, as a member of the public or a citizen, what can you do? If you hear this information that I've shared with you, maybe some of it's new, maybe some of it you've heard of before. And a lot of times when I speak to public groups, people are really upset by this. Some of this stuff is very upsetting information. And so they're very motivated and want to help. So what can you do? Well, the first thing is if you or someone you know is being trafficked after you've learned exactly what that looks like, report it. Someone's got to report it or else we can't get the victims the help they need. Um, if you see something suspicious, report it. You know, I've given you some of the indicators. If you think that looks suspicious, it's better to report it than not report it. Um, one victim <laughs> saved is worth five who might feel embarrassed. <laughs> so. Um, Learn more about human trafficking and educate others. Oh, maybe some of you belong to professional associations with your, with your occupation. Um, I go out and speak to a lot of small businesses about labor trafficking, supply chain issues, the hotel and motel industries, folks like that who human trafficking is a real issue. So if you're interested in learning more or you want to talk to your professional groups about it, um, I can give you resources and information. If not, come talk to your group, um, and stand up for human dignity. That's why we're here talking about human rights. So how do you report human trafficking? Well, if it's, if it's a crisis situation, if you see something, it looks very dangerous, of course you call 911. You know, like I said, we're training all the law enforcement officers in our state, um, 911 dispatchers, all those folks are being trained. Um, the Polaris Project National Hotline that's open 24-7 you can also text on that. A lot of um, younger people utilize that hotline, but you can always report suspected human trafficking there. Um, to report a sexually exploited or abused minor, um, NICMEC, the acronym, uh, which is located in Washington, they do a lot of good work on helping um, exploit and abuse children. And then of course, our unit, we have a 1-800 number that you can call with a tip or you can request information or you can just, sometimes we get calls from people who say, something just seems weird down at the gas station. You know, I'd really like someone to check it out. And then we pass that on to, look, to their local law enforcement. Um, in, in the PSA that the Attorney General um, that I shared with you, January was, was um, Human Trafficking Awareness Month for the past two years, this year and last year. 
we've partnered with the governor and done an official proclamation for Kansas declaring it's Human Trafficking Awareness Month. That's a national um, thing too. Um, really, half the battle is awareness of the crime. I think that's obvious after learning about this. Um, we work together with other uh, state agencies, such as Department of Transportation and Department of Labor. We've talked a lot about that. But we also work with you know, the Department of Revenue and, and places where um, posters and awareness materials can be put. So like at the DMV, everyone has to go there. So we partnered with them in getting the word out. We posted our awareness posters at all of the state-owned rest stops across Kansas. I don't know if they're still up, but we try to replenish those on a regular basis. I just mentioned that. And in schools, of course, where it's very important. These are just a couple of the federal initiatives or resources on human trafficking. A lot of the federal agencies have programs or campaigns against human trafficking as well. So basically, as you can see, it's just a huge and complex issue. We've made a lot of progress, and in Kansas specifically, some of these national organizations give out a report card every year based on a number of factors. Some things we can't meet because there are you know, changes to the law that you know, our, wouldn't really fit our state. But we, we have gotten, we have jumped two letter grades. We've, got, we've gone up. Uh, with this new package of laws. So our state is actually kind of in the forefront of being very progressive on human trafficking. Um, we do a lot of work with these national organizations who ask us to come and present on our advisory board or our package of laws because we're actually doing something. So we, we, we feel pretty good about that. But boys, there are a lot more to be done. This issue is not a simplistic issue that can be solved with you know one or two quick fixes or changes. So. With that, I will wrap up and I will say, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions about something I said, I'd be happy to explain further. Or if I didn't say something that you wonder about, please ask me. Don't feel shy. Yes. 